So good morning. Um, if you are joining with us either live or later online, I um, want to give a warm welcome to you online. And then for the rest of you, welcome. And let me pray for us, and then I'll tell you what our plan is for today. Loving Father, give thanks for this morning and pray your blessings over us. And um, Lord, as we have the gift of being in your word and we start to work through verse by verse uh, Paul's letter to the Corinthians, this first one, uh, ask your Holy Spirit to bless our study and speak into our hearts. And um, I pray that we might even be a little bit surprised today. Um, the way that you can speak through just introductory matters, just greetings and hellos, and um, and yet um, you have depth, and um, and as we come to remember that uh, these letters are taking place within um, context of life, back and forth, ongoing relationship, um, reminds us of all the different ways that you're at work. So bless us today, in Jesus' name, amen. So, um, my plan for today is this. We're going to walk through the first nine verses, and, and then we're going we're gonna to step back, and we're going to theologize a little bit together. And, um, and, and, and that is, is we're going to first, you know, read the letter, get the sense of content, and then we're going to pull back and say, okay, what are the themes that Paul brings up, and, um, and what is his focus? So... A couple of things we we started last week. We said if we're studying uh, a book of the Bible, it is helpful to try to get the big picture of it. So one of the things you can do is read through the whole thing. Um, and that, that whatever book it is, it's always a good idea to do. But especially with a letter. And then the other part is is. Is there anything that we can know about the background, especially because of a letter? Um, I shared this in the sermon on Sunday. All of Paul's letters, minus his letter to the Ephesians, were letters responding to some situation in some way. Even Paul's letter to the Romans, where he had not founded that church, had not yet gone there, he knew that there was a Jew-Gentile divide within the church, and he was responding to that situation even as he was looking forward to form a relationship with them and help and have them help him be supported to go on to Spain and share the gospel in Spain. Uh, so those, those background information, we talked about this just briefly. Well, we talked about it more extensively last week, and I'll just mention those things. So a port city, a large Greco-Roman city, it is a Roman colony. It had been destroyed uh, by the Romans in around 144 BC, 146, uh, because they, because Corinth uh, was the ringleader of trying to defend against Roman incursion. And so the Romans made an example of them. And the city was wiped out for 100 years. And then it was Julius Caesar in about 44 BC who said, this is a great strategic location. This is, this should be a port. And he repopulated it um, as a Roman colony with a bunch of Roman freemen, which were at the bottom of the social scale in Rome, but still Roman citizens. They bought their freedom. Now, we're, let's see, if that was 44 BC and we're moving up to 52. So, you know, this is almost a hundred year, this is a little more than a hundred, not 40, no, about almost a hundred years later. Um, it's grown up, it's significant, one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. And then what's key for it is, is that we have actually some history about this specific congregation because of the book of Acts. And so when you think about studying 1 Corinthians, then you go, okay, well, I, 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 need, to, I need to read Acts chapter 18 where we hear about Paul's interactions. We know that Paul has a long-standing relationship. There's probably four different correspondences at least that Paul had with them by letter. This probably isn't the first one, it's the second one. Um, and, and there's some problems. A couple of things about this. Um, they're believers, but they are 
they're looking more like the world than they're looking like Christ. And we all suffer from that. But um, what's getting ingrained in us, and Paul's concern for them is, is that the world is continuing to get ingrained and the way of Jesus is not. So this is part of the letter, 11 different things. And, um, and it, at, one of the core things, and this is, this is gonna come up as far as we open this letter today and look at these verses, there is a contention between Paul and the Corinthians. Um, they are rejecting his leadership in some way or calling into question. And that's pretty serious stuff, um, both from the sense that God's called him to be an apostle, he founded their church, but also from that sense that um, why they're doing it, you know, there seems to be a little bit of, they, they want to, they, they want a teacher who is wise, smooth, articulate, a celebrity. You know, I mean, that, that, that they want something, they want somebody flashy. And Paul is not living up to their ideals. And so they're, they're squawking. Okay, with all of that, we'll come into this. Now, um, we have 13 letters of Paul. His early, his, Corinthians is one of his earliest letters. Thessalonians is probably earlier. And, um, and one of the things is, is that in Thessalonians, it's pretty straightforward. In Corinthians, we start to see a little bit of development. And there's things that happen in Paul's greetings that become unique. And, um, and, I, and I'm going to point those out to you. Some of how we know that they're unique is we can compare Paul's letters to other letters that we have from the ancient world. And then we also can compare Paul's 13 letters. And what we notice is, is that Paul doesn't begin his letters quite the same way. And, and, and what students of scripture have come to understand is, is that Paul is coming at this. You can, almost, you can be assured that he's coming at this prayerfully. And he has an idea of where he wants to go. And, that, and, though, and, and where he wants to go in this letter leaks out from the very first swipe of the pen that is beginning to put ink on that parchment. And so, um, Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Typical opening, you just state your name. You don't state all that other stuff. Um, Paul doesn't regularly in his opening, I mean, he does it a couple of times, but he doesn't regularly in his opening identify himself as an apostle. For example, in his letter to the Philippians, he calls himself a slave to Christ. A, a contrast for that, um, in the ancient world, if you are sent at, and, and this is what the word apostle means, it is an emissary sent with the authority of the one sending them. So if you are an apostle to a king, then you, you're not the king, but you're a significant person because the king has entrusted you to be their representative. That's a much different feel than I'm a slave. Now, um, Paul begins these things because he, he, he knows that he needs to make an impression from the very get-go. So, we listen to this and we go, okay, so why would he want to accentuate his apostleship? Because they're calling into question whether he's really a legitimate founder of the church representing God or should they be listening to somebody else as their leader? And so from the get-go, this is Paul, you know, the founder of the church, um, an apostle. And we, we will read, well, some people got baptized by Apollos, some people got baptized by Peter, some people got baptized by Paul. 
There's these lineups that are forming. Neither Peter or Apollos or Paul would like these lineups that are happening, but this is what the Corinthians are doing. But Paul's coming and he's saying, okay, so an apostle, but, but how am I an apostle? By the will of God. This isn't, this isn't me. This is the call that God has on my life. And if you're sitting there and you're rejecting me, you're really rejecting what God is doing. Um, Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus. One of, this is one of the lovely things that, you know, is when, as we read through, and as I think especially together, um, and we start paying attention to details. Typically, w what we find in Scripture is when, and when we see Christ, it says Jesus Christ. And, and then the, that's where, and I was one of these people who, you know, at, at one point I thought that Christ must have been his last name, right? You know, just, that's just how it goes because, you know, his first name is Jesus and his last name is Christ. And that's how we all speak today. So isn't that how, but, but that's not the way it works. Christ is not, it's not even a personal name. It's a title. Um, in Greek, it's Christos. It, um, it is almost assuredly a, a translation of Meshiach um, because Jesus primarily in Palestine, they spoke Aramaic. And so, um, and, and so Meshiach, the Messiah, is the Aramaic expression of this word, which means anointed. And it is referring back that this is the, this is the claim that he is the anointed, and then we put it in its Old Testament context, and there was going to be one who was the line of David, who was going to be anointed, the Son of God, and he was going to bring forward the kingdom of God. That's who Jesus is. That title, it, it means anointed, but in our biblical context, it, 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 it's, it's our king. You know, it is the one who is anointed to be the one true king over the entire universe. So, when Paul says Jesus Christ, he, he is talking about the Jesus that we know who was born of Mary, who is the anointed one. But every once in a while, he will say Christ Jesus. Now, in Greek, word order is significant because in English, we, we almost always go subject, verb, object. And, th and that's how we construct our statements. And um, uh, unless you're like Yoda from Star Wars, and then it's like, why is you are? And, um, and, and, and then, you know, and then it kind of like bounces off of us and we think it sounds deep because it doesn't follow the order. But, but the typical thing in English is, is subject, verb, object. In Greek, it doesn't work that way. In Greek, you can put the word wherever you want in the sentence. And, and, and you know what it is because the endings of the word tell you what it is. So, if you want to have emphasis like on the action, go! It, and, and, and then you can t say everything else that you want to say. Um, it, so, when you come to this and you say, well, if it's typically Jesus Christ, and, and, and that's a title... And, and, and Jesus comes first. Jesus, it's probably intended to be said that way in a more personal way. Like, Jesus, my king. You know, because it's not like the title coming first and then the name. It's the personal name that's coming at me. Jesus, who loved me, saved me, died for me. And he is my king, the Messiah. But if you're going to say Christ first, then it says, King Jesus. And so Paul says, Paul, called to be an apostle of King Jesus by the will of God. Now, emphasis on king. The Corinthians are about my wisdom, my gifts, my privileges, my status, my rights, 
And Paul's coming back here and ever so non-subtly saying, oh, okay, this is Paul. And I am the official envoy of King Jesus, called and commissioned to go and share the gospel and plant churches. And this wasn't my thing. This is by the will of God. You know my story. I was persecuting the church and then I got struck down on the road to Damascus. Paul tells that story three times in the book of Acts. He, people who knew him knew that story. Why? Because my story is King Jesus's story. This is about who he is and what he's done. And my life is completely different than what it was going to be if I was living all on my own, if I was doing it my way, if I, if, if, if I was just in charge of things. I could still be persecuting the church. But this isn't a story about my life and what I want and me getting my way. But it is a story of blessing and it is a story of power. It's the power of King Jesus. And I do have some power here. I did find, found this church in Jesus' name. This is what God called me to do. I was headed one way and then the spirit disrupted me and said, no, I want you to go over to Macedonia. And that's how I ended up coming to you guys. They, they would have known that. He, he, he spent a year and a half with them. And so, so, there's, so there's this part where, you know, for us, there's two things. There is this an assertion of authority, but it's taking place within a story. I mean, a, a real life events. And so there's the context. And again, I, we were talking a little bit last week about this, is that Paul sometimes, especially through like his correspondence to Corinthians, people don't always like Paul. He's a little, you know, he'll, 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 he'll tell you like it is. And he's doing it right here. But I don't think it's all as harsh as it sometimes comes across. But there is a little bit of harshness to it because you gotta, when people are running off the cliff full tilt, you gotta say, stop! Well, don't raise your voice. I'm not trying to, but you're running off the cliff. You know, so, so here Paul opens up. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God. Now, this next part is unusual as well. And our brother Sosthenes. Now, when um, if you go and read Thessalonians, you will find that Paul wrote that um, with Timothy and, and off the top of my head, I can't remember who the third person is. Um, and, and what's interesting is, is that typically in the ancient world, you did not have multiple names at the beginning of a letter as if people were writing the letter together or whatever, or whatever it may be. That's, so this is an unusual thing, but Paul ends up doing this and this won't be the last time. Um, Philippians is another place, um, but where, where it's not just him, but it's one of his companions. Now, what's interesting is in, in Thessalonians, what we will sometimes miss is, but is that when it, it's speaking, Paul will say, we. And, and he's addressing them and, and he's saying we. And that's where it would look like with the letter of the Thessalonians, it really was a work that Paul did together with his two companions. And so this is coming from us. In this one, it, it, everything is in the, it, where he's talking from himself, it's just in the first person singular. Um, now, a couple of possibilities. One is, and, and, and if you didn't know this, it would seem that in, um, it's common practice for Paul in writing his letters was to have a secretary, an Amenaeus who would be there and they would be writing down what he was saying. So he composed it orally and then he would have somebody. We, we get this very clearly from Paul's letter to the Galatians where he's having trouble with that church and, and at the end of that letter, he says, and I, Paul, with my own hand, am writing this. And, and there he's signing the letter with his own hand because he had a secretary who was doing the other part of it. Um, so there, there is one possibility that Sosthenes is um, his secretary. But 
We don't know. Could be. Um, the other part, though, is this. Our brother. Um, so, this name, Sophonis. We actually heard it last week in Acts chapter 18. We do not know if this Sothenes is the same Sothenes that was mentioned in Acts 18. But let's familiarize ourselves with the story. Uh, Paul um, begins to preach the gospel to Gentiles. And the Jews start to create issues. And they finally bring uh, Paul before Galileo, who is um, the, the, the Roman representative over, the, over this entire district. And they bring charges against Paul that he's inciting the people. And Galileo listens to those things and dismisses them and says, this is your own inner squabble. You guys go figure it out. And he kicks him out. And after that event, one of the, who was called the, the leader of the synagogue, Sothenes, ended up getting attacked by a mob of people. There's a little bit of a lack of clarity of exactly who, whether it was his own Jewish brothers who were so mad at him that he failed to get Paul put up on charges or whether there was just an anti-Jewish crowd. But in some way, when he got turned out of that court scene, Sothenes got attacked because he was the ringleader who brought charges against Paul. Now, if this is that Sothenes, what it tells you is, is that Sothenes, who was a Jew, who was the leader of the synagogue, who led with charges against Paul, has become a Christian and now is a companion with Paul. Again, we don't know if this is the case, but this isn't the most common name in the world. And so this, this, this is a real possibility. In fact, I would say that most students of the Bible pretty much think it's probably the same person. And one of the reasons they think this is because they know that Paul loves Jesus and he understands the way that we Christians are supposed to live. So, does Paul see... Uh, we're going to go back and, and put ourselves back in Corinth in about 52 AD. Paul gets brought before Galileo. And he's, it, it, what we know from Paul is, is Paul is trusting in God. He actually looks forward that he's going to be able to go and preach the gospel in Rome when he gets arrested later in Jerusalem. He's already allowed himself to be arrested in Philippi. And he saw God work through all of that. And if you don't remember the details of Philippi, God caused an earthquake to happen that shook the whole building and then all of the doors fell off the prison and, and they could walk out. But Paul didn't walk out because the prison guard would have lost his life. And so they stayed there and then they witnessed to him because he couldn't believe that they didn't just leave. And then his whole family became Christians. So... Paul's really focused on doing God's will. So he walks out and then he sees this well-intended Jew who is confused and deceived because Paul had been confused and deceived. Led these charges against him, but he's really a lost sheep of Israel. And then he gets attacked. Now, has anybody here ever been beat up I haven't, so I, I'm sure it's humiliating, especially if it takes place in public and it hurts. And, and, it's in, and in that societal context, it would have been especially humiliating. If my whole life is about glory and I am the leader of the synagogue and I walk stately and I wear the right robes and I do all the things and then I go here and I speak and then I get kicked out on my bum and then the crowds come and they attack me and they beat me up. So, that's a bad day. 
bad day. And nobody probably wants to deal with them. And a lot of the Jews from the synagogue are upset with them. But it would not be surprising at all if Paul went over to him right after that and then ministered to him. We don't know, but we shouldn't be surprised. Um, now, the, what we do know is, is that Paul brings him up because they know him. And uh, invariably, he, I mean, this is the part where if he's the same Sothenes, he's a Corinthian, right? And, and almost invariably, this person is from Corinth. And so Paul is writing this contentious letter, and he's writing it with somebody that they know. Paul has some information about what's going on. There's a letter that's been sent. He's going to be responding to those things. But um, as you read this letter, this is not me speaking from blindness. This is me responding to the information and the facts. And in fact, I've worked with Sothenes. And Sothenes, one of your very own, our brother, he, he's helped me in this so that what I'm speaking can hit the mark and be accurate. Um, and, 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 and just so you know, this is a very wise way to approach this, right? Um, here's somebody, they're with me, we're trying to reach out to somebody else, this person's part of that group, okay, well, let's talk about this, here's my ideas, I go through, I do my stuff, I share it with you and you can give me feedback and then what we end up making is going to be better than what I could do all by myself. Okay. Not bad, 20 minutes, one verse. We're just cruising along. <laughs> um, okay, so first, the person writing, then the people, the addressees who are receiving, and then a greeting. That's just so you know, from the letters from the ancient world, you know, we do dear whoever, dear rich, if I write a letter. Yeah. And, and, and maybe, you know, like formally, there might be a date there so that you can know that. Date, dear rich, and then that. That's our normal way of doing a letter. There's person writing the letter, people receiving the letter, and then a greeting. To the church... to the church of God. Now, just so you know, there's just a subtle difference between this opening and how Paul does it to the Thessalonians. In, in, in his first letter, he says, to the church of Thessalonica of God. But, most likely, he, Paul thinks about this and he doesn't want them to again think that they're all that. He doesn't want to think that this is about their story and their rights and, and, and their glory and their will and, and, and this is all about them. And so he, he wants to affirm, none of us own the church, God owns the church. Now the word for church, ecclesia, significant word, both uh, from the sense of Old Testament, but also in Greco-Roman society. The Old Testament backdrop is, is that, um, and ultimately in the book of Exodus, you're going to hear about this as we do this in the sermons in the weeks ahead. God called Pharaoh to let my people go that they might come out and worship me in the wilderness. And that gathering of people who, who gathered out in the wilderness to worship God, the Greek translation of that gathering is ecclesia. Because that's what, Ecclesia is a gathering of people. The Old Testament backdrop is, is that God's people are those who are called to worship. And we find our identity as we gather together for worship. And this word church is, is that idea, the gathered people of God for worship. It also happens to be the word in the Greco-Roman context that describes the, the, the in, from the Greek world, the, the, the citizenship population who makes decisions for the direction of the city. 
So it's, it, it also just has a very significant sense, the, um, the politique, the, the, the core of the citizenry, who do, that, that's called the ecclesia when they gather together. Um, and, and there is a sense that, you know, here is, as the church of, of Jesus Christ, we are the people that God has gathered together as a kingdom of priests and kings to go and bring forward the mission of God and, and, and we are called together to do this. So two connotations with this. To the church of God in Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. This is, this is a very interesting thing that happens here. Um, again, he's identifying who he's talking about. Uh, to the church of God, now, I'll, I'll give you a little insight. In the Greek, it, it, it's a little bit different than this because there's these, these standalone clauses. And so it first says, to the church of God, those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, the ones in Corinth. Um, so the word sanctify means those to, to be made holy. And, um, and so... We have been made, we are made God's holy people. We are, and, and holiness is, is, it has a religious connotation to it even in the Greco-Roman world. It means to be set apart for sacred purposes. But in the Old Testament, holiness is just a huge concept. I mean, it is a fundamental, just absolutely important biblical idea. God is holy and he calls us to be holy. And, and, and that, and it, the original picture of it is to be set apart. But in the Old Testament, it, it means more than that. Because God is holy. And then he calls us to be holy, which is mean to be set apart for him, his own special people. Um, it, has, it has this ethical purity, even, even a little bit borrowing from some of the concepts of glory, of, of, of pureness, of goodness. Um, it, and, and so now it's not just you're set apart, but you're set apart because there's n going to God because there's nobody like you and you're absolutely good and you are the standard of all goodness and purity and rightness. And so Israel uh, and Isaiah, for example, one of the titles that we get for Yahweh is the, um, the Holy One of Israel. I mean, this is a fundamental attribute of God, and it is supposed to be a fundamental attribute of his people. Be holy just as I am holy. Sanctification is making you holy. And what he says here is, is that to the ones who have been sanctified, you already, because of Christ Jesus, have been made holy. It may not look like it. You may not be acting like it. But this is, again, not primarily a story about what you do or what you accomplish or how good you are or how great you are. You've actually trusted your life to Jesus Christ. And so this is a story about who Jesus is and what he's done. And he has already made you holy because it's... Somebody who is a part of the church of God, the Holy Spirit has come into you. And the very fact that the Holy Spirit has come into you, you are now part of the temple of God, one of the stones that he's building. And he has sanctified you so that you can have this place within this temple as God's people. Is this making sense? Am I boring you? Am I going to? to I, I, you, you guys, I, I, any questions? I'm, I, maybe I'm just, I, maybe I'm just, I'm, I'm, if you want to ask questions, great. Um, now, to the church of God, those who have been sanctified, the ones of you in Corinth, called, now, this is really interesting here. Now, in, in this translation, it says, called to be holy. Um, well, I, I, I thought we'd been sanctified. I thought we are holy. A little tension here, huh? 
Now, this word for holy here is hagios, and it's related to the, 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 uh, the verbal participle that is, has been sanctified. But, you want to know how this is commonly translated in Paul's other letter when, when he includes this in their identity? Saints. So, to the saints in Philippi. Now, does anybody here typically think of yourself as a saint? <laughs> How come? We don't wear robes. We don't wear robes. <laughs> well, I wear a robe, but if you're in the choir every once in a while, I get the chance. Do we don't? Any, any other? We, we know who we are as sinners. We know who we are. So that, okay, so where, where are we getting our idea of sainthood from? The Catholic Church. The Catholic Church. St. Francis. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, so w w Roman Catholics are, are Christians, and, and we love them as brothers and sisters in Christ, but we are not Roman Catholic. And, and our tradition is, is that we allow Scripture to have final authority, and we allow Scripture to critique tradition. The, the Roman Catholic tradition of sainthood is not biblical. Being a saint is not a special class that you've achieved because you've lived a certain kind of life. Being a saint is something that's given to you because you've been sanctified by the Holy Spirit. He has made you holy, and now you are God's holy people. So another way that you could translate this is those who are called to be God's holy people. Or those who are called to be saints. Um, you are a saint. But again, your identity is not established on what you do. Your identity is established on what Jesus Christ has done for you. And if we start walking into our identity being formed by the grace of God, the most important thing about me is not what I do or what I think, but the most important thing about me is what Jesus says about me and what he's done for me. It's going to radically change our life. Now, here's this tension, because this is the only place that Paul does this where he says, those who have been sanctified call to be sanctified people. But I'll tell you, this is, this is, this is, this is Paul's classic ethic of, of, of what he did, of how he approaches people. And, and we will find this all through Paul's letter to the Corinthians. He starts with the indicative, here's what is, and then he gives a charge and he says, so go and do it. And basically, you we're getting this little, this little back and forth. You are the ones who have been made holy by the Holy Spirit, the ones who are in Corinth. And now you're called to go and live that life. Go be those holy ones. Go, go really become who you are. Don't live the lie. Don't fall into the deceits. Don't come underneath the schemes of Satan. But no, allow yourself to, to uh, be who you are, which is the Holy Spirit has his way with you, and he becomes the leader and director of your life. We are going to theologize. We're, we're almost there. Um, now, this is also uh, you know, these unusual things. I know we have 13 of them, so you're gonna, uh, they're, they're not all going to be the same. But um, together with all those everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and our Lord, when Paul writes this letter to the Corinthians, he knows that he's writing it to them, but he's not just writing it to them. He is writing it to all Christians everywhere because the problems that are being faced in Corinth are problems that are going to be endemic with the church, and he is addressing those problems so that everybody can learn from this situation. 
Um, and there's probably just a little bit of, and, and again, Christians in Corinth, it's not just about you. <laughs> you're, you're not in this all by yourself. You're not the lone representative of Jesus in the world. He has a larger church that you're part of. Okay, we know who's sending it. We know who it's being sent to. And then the greeting. Typical greeting, I mean, this is like, like pretty much all the letters that we have in the ancient world outside of uh, what we find influenced by Paul is person sending, those who are getting addressed, and then Kareem, which is greetings. And then now let me get on with my letter. Um, dear Jeannie, you know, I, I, but, 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 but Paul, he's, I, we don't know how this all worked out, but he didn't like the word Kareem. And probably it's not that he didn't like it, but when he said it, at the root of this word is charis, which is the word grace. And he says, am I going to say greetings to you or am I going to say grace to you? And then he says grace. Because ours is a story of grace. Let's not just do what we've always done because this is what we've always done. Let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds through the power of the gospel so that the life that we live is no longer just an ordinary life, but it is a supernatural life partnered with God. Let us rethink everything that we possibly do so that we now think about doing it with Jesus and for Jesus. So I'm even going to change the way that I write letters. Now, probably the greeting is not the most important way that you're going to change how you do things. But it's a sign. Everything's being rethought. Everything's being redone and being conformed to what Jesus would have me do. Again, it's a model for the Corinthians. In the old way of life, if somebody hits me, what am I going to do? I'm going to hit him back twice as hard. That's the law of Lamech. Or seven times as hard. But what does Jesus say if somebody strikes us? Turn the other cheek. What does that mean? This is a tough one, isn't it? Give you the chance to hit you again. <laughs> Give you the chance to hit you again. It, 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 its primary meaning is not be a victim. Its primary meaning is don't retaliate evil for evil. And it's altogether possible that in, in, in that context, everybody would have also understood that you, you only really strike people that you believe who are beneath you in society because there's very strict rules. And so if you strike somebody... It's typically going to be with your right hand and you strike them with the back of your hand. And you do that to people who are lesser than you. If they turn the other cheek, you have to hit them with the palm of your hand. And now that is something that's inviting you to see them more as an equal. That, the, 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 you know, this is the part. Now, that, that's a great possible interpretation because it puts it in all the context of that. We don't really know absolutely if, if, if that was intended by Jesus. But it's not about being a victim. It's not about being a doormat. It's about being a servant who's committed to the welfare of others, so I'm not going to use evil for evil. That, that was Jesus' main point with that. And so, my old way was, I'd probably return evil for evil. But with Jesus, I'm not going to return evil for evil, and I'm going to think about how even if it means suffering for my, on my part, how to come into this situation with redemptive love so that God can use his power to turn this around. Um, okay, the peace part is the normal Jewish greeting. So, and, and, and if you were a Jew and, and you were meeting with somebody, if you, if, you, you wouldn't say greetings you would say shalom. Shalom is this great, rich, Old Testament idea of peace. It's not just the cessation of war or strife. 
It is all of the conditions that make life flourish. And what God formed his people to do is, is that when you meet people, would you extend that desire to see them in shalom? And so when Paul says this, he wants grace to be formed, forming your life. And he wants the peace of God to be forming your life. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The interesting thing about Lord and is, again, that's a title. It's curios. Curios can be translated sometimes as just sir. But in this instance, there is no question that curios <coughs> is, is a title. And in the Greco-Roman context, one of the claims of Caesar is, is that he is now a god and he should be worshipped. And when you worship him as god, you declare that Caesar is Kyrios. And no Christian following Jesus can make that claim because only Jesus is Kyrios. Now there's an interesting thing about this Kyrios is that when they translated the um, Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek and, they, and they, they had stopped using the divine name Yahweh and anytime they saw the name Yahweh they would say Adonai, which is Lord, it's, if you want to translate Adonai from Aramaic into, um, into English, it would be Lord. Well, if you want to translate Lord from Aramaic or its Hebrew equivalent into um, Greek, you, you use the word kurios. The word kurios in the Greek translation of the Old Testament occurs more than 3,000 times. I think it's more than 6,000 times. But I'm, I'm being safe by saying 3,000. And in every one of those instances, what you have there is, is that here is the Lord. Yahweh, God. And when Paul is sitting here and he's saying the Lord Jesus Christ... He is making an affirmation of the divinity of Jesus. And so you see this, you know, this is the part, you never come across the word Trinity in, in the New Testament because they hadn't developed that word yet to try to capture the experience of the New Testament. But what you do have here is this, uh, in Paul, who is our, one of our, is, you know, really our earliest witness to the New Testament, the very clear understanding that when we talk about God, we talk about God the Father, we talk about Jesus Christ, and we talk about the Holy Spirit. And while we confess that there is only one God, the Father is God, Jesus is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. Now this, so, now this part, the person sending, the, the, those who are being addressed, the greeting, it's not uncommon that you might express something about what you're feeling, where you're at, giving thanks for things. For Paul, this becomes a standard part of his letter. Every time you read a letter of Paul, you'll get those three elements, and then you will get some expression of thanksgiving, and he will then share about how he's praying. And one of, the, one of the things to know as a student of the Bible, where you're really beginning to, to dig into this and say, I want to have understandings about you know, what these letters are, what these books are. Um, I don't know if you've noticed this, but over the last couple of Sundays where I've preached, I've, I, I've, I've just kind of begun with a little bit of an aside to say, you know, if, if you wanted to think about how to grow in maturity in Christ, and there could be one book of the Bible that you might turn to that would really understand, help you understand what Christian maturity looks like. Is Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Now, that's a judgment on my part. But what I'm trying to do is, is that you and I, we should become students of Scripture to such a way that when we face problems, when we have questions, we can sit there and we can say, where might I turn if I want to reflect on this and get some wisdom from God about how to approach this? 
Um, the couple weeks before, I sat there and said, you know, if you were really thinking about, if I, if I only had, you know, like, if I knew that I only had a limited period of time left, like a couple of years before I died, and I really want to now live out my priorities, how might I think about what those priorities should be based on scripture? I said, well, one of the places to go to is Philippians, because Paul is facing death, and he's writing to a group of friends, and he's really sharing with them what he thinks is most important. Um, what I'm encouraging you to, to do is, as we become students of Scripture, and we want to be students of Scripture, where we get to know these books in such a way that we have the big idea of what these books are about so that we can then turn to them and go, oh, if I'm in this, this might be a good one to go to. If I'm in this... Um, yeah, and, and, and you know, it's not the only thing that we do. I mean, we do this in Christian community, and, and, but I just want to encourage that. Now, from that, that's the part where we're reading through Paul's letters, and it's like, okay, so he does these thanksgiving, he does these prayers. One of the things to know is, is that what we've come to learn is, is that Paul is thinking about, he's been praying about, this letter is typically, except for Ephesians, in response to some sort of a situation. And so for those who, when we are studying, that thanksgiving and that prayer always tip you off about what's really going on. And so in these few little verses, it gives you an idea of where Paul is going. The other thing to note is this. Thanksgiving. Oh, sorry. Do <laughs> Thanksgiving, on one part, it is the most natural thing in the world to do as we live in a relationship with God because God wants to bless us. But Thanksgiving also is a form of a discipline. I, I would encourage everybody to have Thanksgiving be a regular part of what you do at some point every day. Don't lie. Be honest. Sometimes you may have to look for something to be to, to express thankfulness for. But if we start to do this, you know, it will begin to shape because there is a more pessimistic way to look at the world and there is a more optimistic way to look at the world. And you and I as Christians, we all should be optimists. Now, my wife... We have, we have this uh, ongoing debate because she says that I'm a dreamer and uh, I, I need to be more realistic and uh, she needs to tie me down to the ground because, and, 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 and I come back to her and I say, I'm, I'm not a dreamer, I'm an eschatological realist. <laughs> and eschatology is the study of last things. And in the end, it's all going to work out, people. Jesus is going to come back. He's already sitting on the throne. It's guaranteed that the resurrection is going to happen. The world is not spinning out of control. It's all going to be okay. And God is this amazing spiritual judo artist that whatever the devil throws at him, he spins around and he brings good out of it. So you do not have to worry. And that same sort of optimism should be informing how we see the world and even how we see people. Just imagine what it's like that Paul's writing this letter and he's got these people that he's, he, he spent a year and a half of his life with. They, they know a story. He didn't take any money from them. He, 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 with his own hands, he made tents and all he did was give, give, and give. And here they are calling into question his integrity, his ability, his authority. Yeah, that Paul, he's an idiot. Man, that Paul, he's not spiritual. 
Now I want you to hear what Paul says. I always thank God for you because in his grace given you in Christ Jesus. Now this is kind of a funny thing. He's thanking them in, 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 and he's being honest with it. I'm not really thankful for all their actions. I'm not even thankful for the way that they're really following Jesus at this point. But Lord Jesus, I am thankful that your grace is at work in them and you are gracious to them and they are alive to you because of your grace. Because even though they aren't quite acting like saints, I know they are saints. Paul's thankfulness for the Corinthians focuses in on God because that's the best that he can say because this is really about God. But he's thankful for them. For in him you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge. And just so you know, this, this is where this is going to go. He's naming it. This Christian life is about Speaking truth. And this Christian life is about real knowledge. And the Corinthians are all caught up in this stuff. We're super spiritual. We're really wise. Some of us speak in tongues. We're the top of the heap. <clears throat> and he knows it's going to go there. And so it's getting addressed. But now it's getting addressed in, in the light of, and just so you know, all of this comes from God. Because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Again, you're focusing in on yourself and you're forgetting. And you're rejecting me. But the only way that you came to Christ was because I had the opportunity and gift to be able to proclaim Christ to you. And into that, you became Christians. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. Uh, here is the Christian life. We reside between Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Um, Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, he will be revealed to everyone as Lord. Every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, and Jesus will not only be enthroned in heaven, but he will be enthroned on earth. And up there will finally be married to down here on earth as it is in heaven will become the reality. But between now and then, we follow Jesus in a world where we are little colonies of heaven shining the light of Christ out into the darkness. That's what we're about. He will keep you strong to the end. So that you will be the blame, so you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. I know things are rough right now. I know they're struggling right now. I know that we're not really getting along right now. But I have every hope that this will all work out for good in the end. And I am not concerned for your salvation. I know that Jesus will hang on to you if you are indeed truly saved. It's going to be okay. And I'm thankful for all of this. God, who has called you into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Um, and so there is Paul's thanksgiving and it's ultimately it gets focused on God. And they get caught up into it because his focus is on God, because God's reached out to them and saved them. And even though they're not getting it right now, that's OK, because God's at work. He's bigger and stronger and wiser, and he surprises us. Um, so there's our, our little opening to the letter. Um, is it really 10 o'clock? Mm -hmm. Yes. Any questions? <clears throat> so um, we should start addressing you as St. Brown? Uh, St. Rich? Yes, indeed. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> Let me, let me give you this. As we stand back and we look at the structure of what Paul does and we, and, we, and we pull out the big ideas, there are four things that we learn about God, specifically in his character in this. 
God has a will. And that is a huge idea. I mean, if you want to know, because God has a will, his will is the most important thing. We have, we have wills, and we're supposed to submit them to his will. But the Christian life is primarily about God's will being done, not my will being done. God is our father. God has extended us grace through Jesus Christ. And God is faithful. Um, uh, we'll, we'll start next week and we'll do a little theologizing and then we'll, and then we'll just keep going. Um, I'm sorry it took so long to get through those things. Hopefully there's things you learned today. That was my prayer. Let, any prayer requests for today as we, as, as we break? Yeah. Wendy Brashear is, her whole family is sick with stomach flu. So oh, for them. okay. And Chris Ralph, well, we had a great, great night. Cool. Was, did I see another hand, Steve, or was, I, I, was peripheral vision stuff going on? Lord, we lift up um, Winnie Brashear and her family, and uh, Lord, um, we just ask that they would quickly uh, get over the, this um, uh, bug to their stomachs and, and, and help them both um, gain strength, uh, be able to find rest and, and get better. And then, Lord, we, we do give thanks for Alpha and we pray your blessings. Uh, if there is a real spiritual battle, Lord, you know this, that, um, that happens. And, and so as we, as we are doing this work of bringing forward the gospel, um, the devil is at work doing everything that he can, trying to keep those who are still not in your kingdom away. And so we pray, Lord, for all the guests that um, you would both protect them. Pray that you would be at work in their hearts, drawing them to you. That they would come back. And that, and that your presence and power would be more powerful to draw them than any lies or deceptions that the devil might get in the way of their return. And we continue to pray over the blessings of the team. And uh, we lift up Dee to you in particular and pray, Lord, uh, just blessings on her back as she continues to work in the kitchen, um, making Alpha possible. Uh, so bless us as we go out this day. In Jesus' name, amen.